Hi everyone, this is Fabi and in today's video we'll be talking about DMA or direct memory access, a concept which is essential not only in the embedded world but to all computing systems. If you're new to the channel, this video is part of an educational series I'm doing called Embedded Systems Explained and the aim of this series is to teach you embedded systems concepts in a simple to understand manner and with examples so that you know where these concepts are being used in the real world. If you want to learn more, make sure to watch the other videos from the series as well. I will put a link in the pinned comments down below. Quickly before jumping to today's video, I want you guys to hear a quick message from today's sponsor, PCBWay. Special thanks to PCBWay, which is a one-stop shop for all your PCB prototyping, 3D printing and CNC machining needs. Click the link in the description to buy 5 PCBs with 2-4 to four day shipping for under $30. If you have an idea for a new product or already have everything developed, PCBWay offers complete manufacturing services from producing PCBs, buying the necessary parts, assembling the PCBs, CNC machining, 3D printing, even injection molding, all the way to final assembly. No matter how complex your project is, PCBWay has got you covered. Okay, so DMA or direct memory access is a capability of microcontrollers or processors which allow peripherals to have access to the memory of the system without the CPU intervening, which means that memory operations are going to be sped up and the CPU is going to be available for other tasks. In low power embedded systems specifically, the fact that the CPU is not involved in this process means that it can stay longer in low power, which in turn obviously means that it's going to consume less energy. In the Texas Instruments MSP430 family of microcontrollers that we commonly take a look at during the series, the memory bus is shared between the DMA and the CPU, which means that access to memory or registers is not available to the CPU while the DMA is working. So this essentially means that while the DMA is working, the CPU is not. It is true that in this case, one of the advantages of the DMA, namely that the CPU can run other tasks while the DMA transfer data is lost, in the case of embedded systems, this is not really an issue. This is because, as you surely know by now, in embedded systems we care way more about low power than we care about processing power. Setting up the DMA mostly involves setting your source and destination addresses and the transfer mode. We will talk about these modes in just a little bit. Depending on the microcontroller you use from the family, you will have up to 8 transfer modes and each are going to be independently configurable and they also have selectable priorities. The reason for the priorities is the fact that a DMA transfer happens when a trigger occurs. Because we can have multiple channels active and triggers on multiple channels can happen at the same time, we can prioritize these DMA channels to our needs. The trigger source is selectable for each channel independently and it can be as simple as setting a bit on one in a register of the DMA or it can be a flag which can come from the timer, from the ADC, from the DAC, it could even come from the serial communication interfaces or the hardware multiplier. On microcontrollers with USB, it can even be a USB related event. Because of the shared memory bus we talked about, we have multiple transfer modes to work with and some of them allow CPU activity to be interleaved with DMA transfers. The first transfer mode is called single mode and this requires a trigger for each byte transferred. Block transfer still requires a trigger but this will transfer a whole block of data when triggered. Then we have the burst block transfer mode which makes it so that CPU activity is interleaved during the block transfer. This can be very useful if you have tasks that your CPU has to do while the transfer is happening. In the case of the MSP430, this limits the CPU execution capacity to 20%. For these three transfer modes we talked about, the DMA enable bit which you have to set before actually transferring any data with the DMA will be reset after a successful operation. This means that for every transfer, apart from the trigger which has to come, you also have to enable the DMA specifically. There are a further three modes named the same but with the prefix repeated. In this case, the enable bit which needs to be set in order for the DMA to work 
will remain set after a successful operation. Further operations need only the trigger as the enable bit will already be set. One essential thing to keep in mind is that system interrupts do not interrupt DMA transfers. Depending on the application, if for example you must execute something after an interrupt happens without any delay, you must either not use the DMA at all or stop it beforehand. If you don't know when this important task which is triggered by the interrupt is going to come up, and this is often the case because we're talking about interrupts, then it's going to be really challenging to implement the DMA in your project. Even though it doesn't like to be interrupted, the DMA itself does generate interrupts when it's done transferring. My stats tell me that a lot of you watching still aren't subscribed yet, so what are you waiting for? Why not do it now? So moving on to actual real life applications, the spectrum is really broad and if you already have a few projects under your belt, there are most likely cases where you could have used it. If you use a serial communication like I2C, you can prepare the data to be sent in a vector, start up the DMA to do its job, which is obviously to transfer the data, and let the microcontroller go to sleep. Same with receiving data through a serial communication interface. Let the DMA transfer the received data to a memory address of your choice and wake up the microcontroller only when this bureaucracy is done. Let's say you want to get an analog signal out to a pin, like a sine wave or a more specific wave using the DAC. All you need to do is prepare the samples to be fed to the DAC and then go to sleep. Another scenario would be if you use the ADC to constantly measure the voltage at a pin and then find the average value of this in order to cancel out the noise. You could set up the ADC to work in repeated mode, have the DMA transfer all of those results in memory for you, and only wake up the CPU on let's say the 16th measurement. Then you would add up all of the measurements together, shift the result to the right 4 times, and boom, you have your average result with the minimum amount of CPU time. Okay, so I have to be honest. The reason why I chose this topic for today's video is because I myself have neglected the DMA for far too long in my personal embedded projects, and I think most of you have as well. By doing this video, I rounded up my knowledge on the peripheral and I started using it myself and I'm happy to say that I saw tangible benefits when it comes to decreasing the power consumption of the system. If you like this video, make sure to like it, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. Anyway, if you have ideas for future videos, namely topics in the realm of embedded systems, make sure to leave those in the comment section down below. I'll catch up with you in the next video.